by request, your guide to adding dual extrusion to an existing 3D printer with all of the problem solving that that entails. One of my most frequent video requests over the last few years has been how to add a dual extruder setup to a single extruder 3D printer. And I've always replied that while it can be done, it's not going to be easy. A while ago, one of my patrons, Carl, told me about an off-the-shelf dual extruder kit that definitely took my interest. It uses a servo to switch between two hot ends with a platform to block ooze inbuilt, so you don't need to waste filament on purge blocks or printed ooze shields. It looked really interesting, so I ordered one and I have it working quite well right now, but at times the struggle was truly real. After installation was over, I had to replace broken components, eventually find a bug in Marlin, I had to stop to design an all-in-one enclosure for this printer, plus endless calibrations, so this was definitely not for the faint-hearted. Let me take you through the process in fitting this kit, and we're going to start by looking at the product. MakerTech is the company behind this product, and as you can see, they sell two 3D printers, one of them being the Proforge 2S that comes from factory with the dual switching extruder. They also sell the extruder for any 3D printer as a kit, which is what I purchased for this video. It's currently retailing for just under US $80, but it does come with a lot. Two hot end kits with fans, an extruder mechanism, a stepper motor, filament sensor, additional stepper motor driver, ABL probe, a bunch of hardware, wiring, and even a small spool of filament. The other thing that I purchased and I would recommend if you're going to follow this video is one of these tool carriages and belt kits. There's quite thorough documentation for each step of the process. Overall, I'd give the instructions about a 9 out of 10. What's there is pretty thorough, but there were a couple of things I found were missing. So how do you know if your printer is suitable for this kit? The first thing you need is a 2020 extruded gantry to suit the new carriage. You'll want a fairly big printer. As you can see, it sticks outwards and down, and I lost 50 millimeters from Y and Z. The ABL probe that comes with this kit senses metal only, so glass won't be any good. However, an add-on kit like the Wham Bam I have here will be sufficient. The biggest one is probably the main board. We need a board like an SKR version 1.3, or what I used, an MKS Gen L, because it has five outputs for stepper motor drivers. If you've got the standard Ender 3 or CR10 board, or you've upgraded to an SKR Mini or TH3D Easy Board Lite, your board won't be compatible. Meeting all of these conditions for me was the Tebow Tornado, which shares a lot of components with the CR10 and Ender 3. Assuming you have the right type of main board, you'd be able to follow onto the build on either of those printers. The kit assumes that you already have one extruder and therefore comes with an additional extruder for you to fit. I had already upgraded to an E3D Titan Aero which I disassembled to retrieve the stepper motor and found that it was almost exactly the same as the new one in the kit. I decided to scavenge from my GTEC A10M these easy extruders. I've had a lot of success with them in the past and they're really easy to mount on the top gantry of the printer. Now to assemble the hot ends and they come with E3D V6 clones. This means they're not all metal and the PTFE tube has to travel down inside all the way up to the top of the nozzle. I also noticed the included nozzles were 0.3mm in orifice, so I changed mine for some spare 0.4s I had lying around. Each hot end assembles exactly the same as an E3D V6, and it wasn't long until I had both of them together and ready for the printer. Now for the main feature, which is the mechanism for the switching extruders. We start with this servo that needs to feed in through the top, being careful not to damage the wiring loom. This is an extremely tight fit, and I found it necessary to give it some very little love taps to help push it through. All of the mounting hardware is nicely labeled with correctly scaled images on the back for identification. M4 nuts and bolts are used in each corner to hold the servo to the bracket. With these, the servo feels very secure. Next, we take the smaller bracket that holds the front part cooling fan and we use more M4 nuts and bolts to attach it to the main plate. The two part cooling blower fans can now be bolted to this assembly. Lock nuts are used throughout to stop the part from vibrating free. After this, the auto bed leveling sensor goes into the included hole. The initial aim is to have it protruding around 20 millimeters. 
Next, we prepare the bracket that holds the ooze shields and some PTFE tape is included to wrap around and coat the surface. I'm not sure how well this will work long term, but at least this tape is cheap and easy to buy from hardware stores. Next, I decided to open up and assemble the new carriage. If we were building this for a Pro Forge printer, it would go together as you're seeing here. However, on the Tornado, Ender 3 and CR10, the bolts on the back stick through too far and collide with the metal frame. Therefore, you need to flip the direction of the lower nuts and bolts, moving the nylock nuts to the front of the carriage. This will allow the carriage to reach the far right as well as the far left for homing. It does cause another problem however, in the next step we bolt the carriage to the frame and one of the lock nuts fails on the ABL probe. My solution was pretty simple, use slightly longer mounting hardware than comes with the kit and space out the mounting frame from the gantry by a thickness of two washers. This made it very fiddly to put together and it was hard to film anything besides the back of my hand. But once I eventually did get everything together, the ABL probe just cleared the lock nut. But of course, I had forgotten to install the ooze shield bracket. So I had to undo two of the bolts, mount it in place, and then torque everything back up. I was starting to make progress with the assembly. Next, we have a pivoting bracket that holds the two hot ends, which swivels on a thrust bearing and bolts to the main bracket. The hole for this seems fairly accessible, but I fumbled for quite a while trying to get the washer and lock nut through the inside of the whole thing. Eventually, I got it there, and was rewarded with a satisfying mechanism. Next, we're meant to slide the two hot ends into these openings. This was incredibly fiddly and another thing I fumbled with for quite a while. One thing I really don't like about this design is the way the two bolts are meant to retain the hot end. As you can see, as you tighten the bolts, they twist against it and try to push it out of position. My solution was to design and print this very simple mounting adapter. It slots onto the top of the groove mount for the hot end and then the sub-assembly slides down into place and this means when you do up the bolts, they line up with the holes underneath and this prevents the hot end from squirming and moving too much. You can see that around this time I also mounted it to the machine and did my cable management. For each of the two hot ends you need to make sure your cables are long enough to reach when it's facing straight down but not so long that the cables get caught when it's swiveled out of the way. You'll also need to provide a long enough path for all of the cables wrapped in some sort of sheathing to be secured elsewhere on the printer frame. With everything together, we can also see how the ooze shields block the path of the nozzles to prevent filament from leaking out when the other hot end is being used. Around this time, you're also safe to install the PTFE tube that goes from the extruders on top to the switching hot ends. I found the part cooling fan shrouds that came with the kit sat too low and were going to collide on the top of the printed object. On the website, there's these alternate versions that sit about a millimeter further up. Installation is very easy with both of them just clipping straight on. And this means we can turn our attention to something more serious, the wiring. The wiring for this conversion is a big deal. Here are all the factory wires and then when we examine the new loom, we can see that it's exactly twice as big. I personally find it very frustrating to work on the electronics for a Tipo Tornado and probably a CR10 is the same. You need to disassemble this box and then feed the old wiring out through the grommet. The old metal connector that used to go into the box for the hot end can no longer be used. There's not enough wires here for two hot ends so you're going to need to come up with another solution. I used red and green heat shrink over each set of wires so I could tell which one went to the left or right extruder and hot end. And here was my final wiring. It's as per the instructions apart from the servo, which I plugged into the servo one slot instead of four. And for the ABL probe, I plugged that into the standard factory plug for the Z end stop. One of the docs pages is dedicated to firmware and it takes you through step by step with most of the changes that you need to adapt your existing firmware to this kit. I say most because some things like safe homing were left out and there's a link to my configuration files in the description below. After flashing the firmware, we can see that we now have two hot ends shown on the top left of the LCD display. We can now install the little arm that switches between the two nozzles. After we assemble it, we're meant to put it onto the end of the servo, manually move it through its range of motion 
and then connect to the computer, enter a G-code command to move it to 45 degrees before placing it vertically and doing up the three retaining bolts. I found the position for engaging the right extruder was spot on, but the left one needed tweaking, more on that later on. Beyond this, there were a series of much simpler final steps. These are the type of things that I've covered before, so I'm not going to go into any detail here. The more difficult and specialized parts are in the next section. The kit did come with a spool holder, but it didn't really suit the way I had the extruders, so I borrowed the mounts from the GTEC A10M. So that's how it's meant to go, but as I mentioned at the start, I had a lot of problems that needed solving. I'm going to work through them step by step here, showing the solutions in case you're facing the same thing. First up, the separate control box that's found on the CR10 and TiVo Tornado. After I reviewed this printer, I decided I wanted to make it all in one, but this project was the catalyst for finally getting it done. I took inspiration from Electro Lennon's design on Thingiverse by mounting the power supply and all of the mains voltage components vertically. The MKS Gen L sits underneath the moving bed with two fans to keep things cool. There's a thin lid to let the mains components breathe and then a clip-in panel to cover all of the mainboard wiring and keep it from hitting the underside of the carriage. With the lid in place, you can see there's just enough room for the bed to clear and everything works as it should. I also designed some supporting pieces to help manage the cables, including this strain relief piece to hold all of my hot end wiring. For the LCD, I stuck with a great design off Thingiverse. I still need to mount it, but this case from Mighty Nozzle is a really nice design. After I'd finished my wiring, for seemingly no reason, the ABL probe decided to let out the magic smoke. Fortunately, I had a spare probe from when I made this TrueLev video. The mini version is the same size and therefore it went straight in. Works on glass too. My next problem related to homing and that's that the corner of the bed was nowhere near the nozzle at coordinate 00. zero. Fortunately, this is easy to fix. You use the LCD to move the nozzle into the position where you want it and then via terminal, you enter M206 with your coordinates, in my case 5 and 50, which is entered as M206, X-5, Y-50. The next problem was another component failure, and this time the servo stopped working and I needed to replace it. Judging by the MakerTech forums, this seems to be a fairly common occurrence. A new one cost me $35, but by far the most annoying part was fitting it. After I fitted it, I stumbled across another problem, that after it moved into position, after 10 seconds, it would go limp. And this was disastrous, as it meant that the nozzle was dangling out of position with results that you might expect from such a problem. There's a line in the firmware where we specify the angles we want for selecting the two nozzles. The angles of zero and 100 are meant to correspond to where the arm should be facing. I later worked out that these angles were incorrect, being too far apart from each other and jamming the servo. If for instance, as shown in orange, you ask for an angle that the servo has no chance of ever reaching, it's gonna run at really high amperage, straining to reach that target until it overheats and then turns itself off to relax. The trouble is, I don't remember the original servo ever doing that, which might explain why mine stopped working and a bunch of others have overheated and failed as well. So I needed to set a better angle, but the trouble was whatever angles I input in Marlin, would not actually change the angle selected by the printer. I wasted an entire weekend chasing this, but the solution in the end was to simply switch to the bug fix branch. I finally had full control over the angle of the servo. This means I can enter M280, P0, and then a servo angle until I found the ideal ones for each side. Hopefully you can see I'm creeping up one degree at a time, trying to find the exact engagement point. After this, we repeat for the second side, Again, inching one degree at a time, and when we found our two values, we put them back into the firmware and recompile. Having the larger number as the main value selects the right extruder as the main one. The next problem was to calibrate the correct offset between the left and right hand nozzles. You can see here that the white is overlapping the red instead of coming up against it cleanly. If you home the machine and then put down some tape on the bed and position the nozzle above it, you can then change the nozzle on the LCD and see if it moves to the correct position. We then enter M218, T1, X, and then a minus value that we've determined after this trial and error. Enter M500 to save once you finally have the right number. Now that X is dialed in, we can run a dual extrusion calibration model 
like the one available on their website to download and see how close the fit is and tweak our numbers further from there. It took me a few goes to get it spot on, but my final values were minus 20.2, 0.4 and minus 0.2. My final problem were blobs being deposited on the model despite the ooze shield. In the worst cases, these would knock the model clear when the next nozzle slammed into them. The instructions state that you can bend the ooze shields into place to make sure they're sealing firmly, but this had no effect. I then noticed during printing that the blob was coming before the tool change, so it had to be slicer related. Makertech have a custom version of Cura if you're using their printer, which I was not, and I have made a guide in the past for setting up a range of slices for dual extrusion, in this case, I was using Simplify 3D, and I started with an inbuilt GTEC A20M profile. I did things like remove the mixing extruder, and then come to the G-code tab and input the correct build dimensions. But the real problem for me was in the scripts for the tool change. You can see here it does a retract, but then it tries to move to a new position and prime before it actually gives the T1 or T0 command to perform the tool change. I ended up stripping out most of that, so all it did was the tool change retract, and then the T command to switch to the other tool. And this completely fixed the problem, with the blobs gone and the models no longer being dislodged. The surface artifacts are from the ancient A4988 stepper motor drivers, so I might modify those next. But in terms of the dual extrusion, this model is very clean, and I didn't even need a purge block. It's satisfying to finally get this working, but I'd be lying if I didn't admit it was a nightmare at times. Apart from the broken servo and ABL sensor, I'm still a fan of this kit. Much of the problem solving I had to do was because this extruder set wasn't really intended for this printer, but instead for a specific model. We're just getting started on this because this setup has a lot of possibilities. You could have dual color, like we've seen here. You could have a big nozzle and a small nozzle. You could have multi-material, maybe a PLA with a flex. You could print PLA on one extruder and dissolvable support material on another. Or you could even try the same material from two different nozzles at different temperatures, like the foam filament recently tested on CNC Kitchen. If you're after these parts for the Tornado all-in-one conversion, I'll release those in the near future. If you've got any thoughts, questions, comments, please leave them down below. Thank you so much for watching, and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe, and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.